Right, so this is the official part of the EPS. To be honest, it's a bit boring, but I mean, there's nothing much we can do. We have this agenda in the, in the uh, bylaws, and, and so we need to do it this way. Uh, do we have the EPS members all sitting here? If, could you, the voting EPS members please sit in the first few rows so that it's easier for us to uh, basically do the voting. And then, of course, everyone else is welcome to join. We don't have anything to hide. Uh, and uh, if you find this interesting, then you can, become a, you can sign up to become an EPS member afterwards, of course. Okay, I'm going to try something which is may not work. Unfortunately, we have a number of uh, people who are not here at the conference. I'm going to try to use Skype to, f to basically join them here. Hmm. Okay. He's not answering. So let's just go ahead. Okay, so first of all, welcome to all the new EPS members that we have. We signed up a couple of more EPS, EPS members in recent weeks. We now have 182 members. Ah, this is much better without the transition. Um, so meeting business. What we need for the General Assembly is we need to basically decide on a chairperson for the meeting. We need a secretary and we need two checkers of the minutes. So the first thing that we need is a chairperson uh, chairing it. I would suggest that, um, I don't know, maybe Alexander can do this. <laughs> <laughs> because you have the microphone and then, um, then we need a secretary, someone who can take, um, who can take the minutes. Taking the minutes basically means you have to take down what we discussed and you, then you have to uh, record the votes, the re voting results that, we've, um, uh, that we have and we need then two checkers of the minutes. So basically, okay, Stefan will do the minutes and then we need two checkers who basically say that, okay, these minutes are correct. Daria and who else? Christian. So, the first task for Stefan would be to now note the names of the two checkers, the secretary and himself. <laughs> do, you, do you need a oops, do you need a piece of paper? And normally the the, sec the chairperson of the meeting also does the voting, so Alexander, the first thing that you have to do is you have to establish, we have to have a motion establishing the timeliness of the call of the General Assembly and then we need to vote on that. So just to, uh, as maybe as reminder or introduction to how this uh, works, timeliness of the call, the, the uh, bylaws say that we have to call for the uh, General Assembly 14 days before the actual General Assembly and up to five days before the General Assembly we can make changes to the agenda and the um, like suggestions from the board or uh, board candidates. Sorry, one Yes, I'm <laughs> that's sorry. fine. I'm not prepared, I did too much party last time, I'm sorry. Um, it was, um, um, uh, yeah, so uh, we had a timely meeting in time? 
No? So I can say uh, the meeting was called timely. And Wait, no? abstentions. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have to do all the voting. Sorry. I'm not that. It's the usual kind of process. Anyone against? Abstain? Anyone? Okay. Who's saying everything was in time? Was in time, yes. Like, abstains? So we have like, uh, you are abstain? Huh? You are not, like, you, you say yes. Yeah, okay, that's two, four, six. Stefan, what, what you also need is, we need a, we need a list of all the, all the EPS uh, members six, who have attended the, uh, eight, ten, 11, the General four, Assembly, so please pass around 14, a piece of paper. 15 people in the meeting here, right? No, 16, sorry. Okay, so that, I think we managed that part, people. so let's go to the next one. And as far as I see, everybody said yes. Did any, any abstain? No, just like for double checking? No, 16, yes. <coughs> okay, so next thing is the annual report by the board. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the preliminary results from 2016, the, the actual 27 timeline, not the one that I just showed in the previous talk. Um, and then how we're going to move on. So these are the preliminary results from 2016. Preliminary because uh, we don't have the complete, we've not gone through the complete uh, balance sheet with the uh, local organization, the ACPISS in, uh, from Bilbao yet. Uh, but this is what they reported to us. So the conference made a profit of 71,481 0.55 euros. Um, this currently uh, includes 17,920 euros pending f uh, sponsor payments. So, what uh, the they, they are still having issues getting all the sponsors to actually pay. Uh, we've done a round of emails, so, so we managed to get a few of them to pay, but this amount is still uh, basically blocked. If we do get all the sponsor payments, of course, the, the EPS share will be 50%, and then uh, we get uh, 35,740 uh, and 77 cents from the ACPISS, and that will go towards the uh, EPS budget that we have. If you compare that to the previous years, it's a little lower than 2016, and the reason being that for uh, 2017, we basically spend a bit more money on, on nice things, like, uh, for example, the, the booths um, that we had in, in Bilbao, uh, this was actually a good investment because we had lots of sponsors who really like those booths and they sign up again for this year, so it made a lot of sense to, to do this investment. Yes? Sorry? Ah, sorry, yes, yes, yes. You're right, 2015. Um, let me just fix that. I can fix it later. There you go. Compared to 2014, that's a much better result. And as you can see, we're actually getting some money into basically uh, work on the mission, the new mission that we have that we want to support other other uh, organizations in Europe. Right now we're still uh, the, uh, the, okay, what we have in the bank right now is, or we had in the bank because we gave a loan to the local organization for this year, uh, we had in the bank about uh, the, the 46,000 uh, uh, and 40,000 we basically gave a loan to the Python Italia organization so that they can basically finance the, um, the initial contract payments that we had to do for, for this venue. So let's have a look at the actual timeline of 2017. So in last year in July, we had the election of the new board. In August to October, we did the selection process. Um, the, the selection proce process took uh, longer than expected uh, because we had a few issues with the venues that we originally had uh, chosen or looked at, let's put it that way. So originally the idea was to do it in Como or do it in Milano. Um, 
this didn't work out because the costs were literally twice as much as what we pay here, and so it wouldn't have been sustainable. So we couldn't do it, so we had to go and then find new uh, locations, and Christian then identified uh, some more. It was, I think, Genoa, Riccione, and Rimini. Yes. And another one? No, I think those three. And then eventually we uh, then uh, decided to go with Rimini. We had another candidate, which was uh, uh, Bruno in the Czech Republic. Uh, but the, the problem there was that the venue did not really, I mean, it, it, the venue is, is, it was a nice venue and it had enough rooms, but there was no room that was available for doing large plenary sessions. So they had a room which was very, very long, and so the people in the back wouldn't have been able to see the screen in the front, and so uh, that was a pity. So this is always important when you go to, when you select venues, that you always have to make sure that everything uh, is actually suited for a conference of this size. Anyway, so we decided on Rimini, and then we started the whole process of uh, basically getting everything going with the contract and so on. We launched the preview uh, website uh, early on, but we did not put any dates on it. And the reason was that we had, of course, not signed the contract yet. We started the negotiations with the venue in November, and uh, it literally took until February to basically come to an agreement, and then the final agreement was signed in April. So uh, early in April, we, we signed the contract with the venue, and that was basically the start for us to actually do uh, sponsor agreements. Because, of course, if you don't have a venue agreement and you want to enter agreements with other people, relying on that uh, agreement, you can't. So this caused a serious delay in everything, and we had to basically postpone a lot of things because of that. Um, by December, the refactoring was done, so Patrick basically had, uh, where's Patrick, there he is. Uh, he finished the, the port to Django 1.8, and we now have, the, uh, we now have a, a current Django CMS version running uh, on, on the website as well, which is very good. I think you should deserve a big hand for that. Right, so we now have a modern uh, website again. We had to fix a few issues because uh, there were still some things left from the old code, but uh, over the very last uh, few months, we sorted out a few things. So in January, we started the active work in the work groups, which was way too, too late. We should have started much earlier. In March, we uh, started the website, then in April, the ticket sales, we did the CFP, talk voting in May, and uh, schedule was also late in May. And then now you can see us here during the conference. So it was a really, a really hot ride that we had there. It was really a lot of work. We did not have enough uh, volunteers to do everything, uh, which is why several people had to put in a lot of work especially Christian, who basically was our interface to the, to the uh, venue, because unfortunately the only person at the venue actually speaking English was the secretary of the manager that we had for the venue, which of course did not really help, and also for sourcing all the local, um, the local shops, like for example getting the, the water dispensers, that was done by Christian, I know it's a huge list, like he pretty much uh, managed all the things that we had to do here uh, to, to get the, the conference off the ground and, um, and did a huge number of things. So really, I think he deserves a hand as well. <laughs> right, and now we're sitting here doing the General Assembly. So um, this is the ticket sales development. I don't know if I can... Is there a mouse somewhere? Yeah. yeah, there you go. So in this chart, these are the um, various conference years. And if you see here, this is, this is, the, uh, this is 2017, this green, green chart. And this shows the ticket sales for the conference. And down here, these are the social event tickets. And it's not hard to see to see, but here at the very end. This was, uh, these are the dates from July 7th, so just before the conference. So it's, 
we now have a spark here going up like this. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Perhaps people found uh, Rimini so nice that they all definitely wanted to come to, along to the social event, or maybe they just didn't know that there was a social event. Um, it, it, if you look at the past years, it always seems to happen like that, but this year was particularly strong. We had a very strong spike there. But if you look here, these lines, by the way, are, are, are like um, different uh, special dates, like, for example, opening of the CS, uh, CFP, opening of the talk voting. Um, the early bird sales were here. And like I said, it was in the, I think, I, didn't I say it? No, I did not. Um, the early bird sales for 2017 was literally just one day. So we got sold out in one day. So this is this spark here. And then we had, uh, with the regular sales, we had a very slow kind of start, and that made us a bit nervous. And then after we had the schedule published, which was around here somewhere, then, uh, or the session list, I think, and the schedule came later. Uh, then it started picking up. And as you can see, uh, it ends here, but now, right now, we are basically here again. So kind of the same level again as we had in the previous years. Uh, what we found when working on the website, by the way, is that um, this chart, it has all the ticket sales. So the numbers are not really 100% correct. These in the, the ticket sales include day tickets, of which we usually don't sell a lot. But this year, for some reason, we sold quite a few. Um, and it also includes cancelled tickets. So we have this refund policy so that people can, up to, I think, one month before the conference, they can basically get a full refund of everything. And quite a few people do this. So, for example, they buy an early bird ticket and then just wait whether they can actually come and then just ask for a refund just one month before the conference. And this is not included in here. Um, it is included, in the, the number up here, the 1011, that's with the refunded tickets removed. The chart does not show this. So uh, I, basically, if you, if you compare the various years, we always have more or less the same outcome. Because I don't think that in previous years we had fewer refunds. OK, so what did we do for the organization? Uh, of course, we invited more volunteers to work with, um, with us on the organization. We removed many inactive uh, members, I mean, members that were still marked as being members of the uh, work groups, but were actually not doing anything. We basically turned them into inactive. Uh, we had to fix a few smaller issues with the website. We found, fortunately, found a few more very active uh, volunteers. So Valeria, where is she? She's not here anymore. She just left. So she was very active and uh, doing a lot of things. Sylvia, I don't think she's here. I don't see her. She helped uh, me with the sponsors. Mario, where's Mario? There you are. He was just, he's our uh, water bottle man. <laughs> so. Uh, because of him, you have water in your bottles, essentially. And he, oh yeah, but that, this was, sorry, yeah, this was, of course, uh, this was just at the conference. And of course, he helped before the conference. Every time you went to the, you had a ticket open on the help desk, and he was one of the most active ones answering those tickets and dealing with that. And I think he did a really excellent job, and I think he needs a hand as well. Then we have uh, Manuel Schipper. Uh, he could not attend the conference, unfortunately, but hopefully next year he can make it. Um, he helped a lot with the program work group. And then, of course, ah, oh, yeah, and communication, right. He, he, uh, several blog posts that we uh, posted were written by him. Uh, and then we have Piper. It's like a virtual volunteer. So this is something that Alex Savio wrote. It's a bot. Uh, and uh, the bot was actually very helpful because it kept uh, just going to the help desk, for example, and just finding out whether new tickets open and then posted them to the Telegram groups, which was a very good integration because, it, because you don't then actively have to go to the help desk every time to find out whether something new is there. 
uh, and that's, that was very good. For the sponsors, the Piper does the sponsor agreements, so every time we get a new sponsor, then we just say, okay, they give us the details, the billing details, and then Piper goes away and then just does the PDF for the agreement. Uh, unfortunately, Alex Xavier could not make it to this conference because he has to learn German, and uh, hopefully maybe next year he can, he can join again. So that's really very unfortunate that he changed jobs and couldn't help us, couldn't continue his very active help until then, that point. These are the most active team members in 2017. So as you can see, not very many people. Uh, and this is the reason why it was really a lot of work for most people on this list. Right, then uh, there's an issue, of course, and I don't want to hide it. Um, this is the Python Italia um, setup that we had. Originally, we thought because Python Italia had run EuroPython for three years in Florence very successfully, with lots and lots of help, with lots of um, uh, enthusiasm, we originally thought when basically working with them again for this year that everything would be more or less the same. And it turned out that uh, what, something we didn't know was that Python Dahlia had a huge issue with, or has a huge issue with uh, having volunteers or finding volunteers themselves. And so essentially, uh, the only help that we got was Patrick, who worked a lot on the website. And uh, he also, because he's now the chair of Python Italia, he also uh, was very responsive uh, in, in signing the, the contracts, of course. Uh, and we had Matteo help with the bank transfers and the finances. So basically, Matteo was our interface to the financial side of things. Um, but essentially, that was about uh, it for the for the help from Python Italia. We did have uh, a lot of help from Francesco. He's not here. Uh, here on site. So when we came to the conference, it, it just uh, Francesco started basically just living up to being a really good volunteer, and he helped a lot on site. So essentially, uh, basically, our expectations were not fulfilled, and uh, this had a huge burnout effect on the active organizers. So what we did is, um, to as compromise for this, we uh, basically changed the contract details that we had. Originally, the, the idea was always to do a 50-50 split between the local organization and um, the EPS for the profit. And we've now renegotiated that to cap the amount, the profit share of the uh, Python Italia to 10K. And we're both fine with that, and I think uh, we've basically, I think that's a good solution to, to uh, basically the issue. Of course, uh, this, whole thing reminded us that we need to rethink the whole way of how we do conferences because what happened this year should never happen again because it's simply if it ever happens again and we don't have volunteers who are willing to put in three to four hundred hours uh, into the organization then our, your Python won't happen it's simple as that um, and so we need to figure out how to when going forward how to address this and to make it to make it less of an issue um, when basically volunteers break away. And we're going to discuss uh, this in this open space session later on. So we don't, have, we don't have any good basically recipe for this of how to do it. We know a couple, we have a couple of ideas of how we can improve things, but it's, uh, it's very difficult to actually communicate. Because on one hand, we don't want to make it look like uh, that, um, okay, let's, let's start differently, just to give you some idea of what the issues are. When EuroPython goes to, to a country, then of course EuroPython is a large conference, and so you get a lot of attendees there. When that country has a, has a local conference, like a local PyCon, uh, it essentially means that basically EuroPython overrides the local uh, conference. Um, and it's, it's We've seen that with Python, uh, PyCon Italia, when they did EuroPython, and then EuroPython moved on to um, to Berlin in that case. 
um, what happened for PyCon Italia is that their attendee counts, they dropped by at least 50%, probably even more. I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, Giovanni told me that it was a significant hit for them. And it was uh, very hard for them to basically reach the same levels again as they had before the conference. And um, this is one issue. The other issue is that, of course, you, when you have a local team or you want the local team to actually participate in this, they uh, need to be available. So if you have the local conference and Europe Python be too short after each other, with um, not enough time for, for the local team to basically recover and get new energy and so on, then you can basically not rely on the local team anymore. And so that's one of the issues that we, we have to uh, address. The other issue is that the local teams often don't have the expertise to, to talk to venues like these because they usually do ve uh, the uh, conferences in much smaller venues or even hotels where it's a lot easier to negotiate these things. Uh, with these venues, they, they really try to uh, make a lot of money, and so you have to be very, very careful when setting everything up. We do know how this works, and so we need to basically, uh, we need to do the negotiations directly with the venue instead of just going via a local team. Anyway, I'm going to talk about more, that, uh, more about that in the open space session. Um, but this slide already shows a few things that we need to address, so we want to not rely so much or having to rely so much on the um, on-site teams anymore. We want to set up the whole process of selecting venues using a commercial RFP process. I don't know if you know but how that works, so essentially you, you give them, you send them a spreadsheet with all your questions and they have to fill it in. You set up a timeline for that. Uh, they need to send you contracts, and then they uh, basically they are competing for you. So they would the venues would be competing for your Python conference rather than us saying we want to do the the conference at your site, which puts us into a weak position because then they can be because they know they are the only conference venue in that location, which can actually do a your Python. You normally don't have two in in a single location for more than a thousand attendees, um, and. This process would make it better for us because they would compete for us and uh, we'd also get better prices. And then we also want to move away from this profit sharing with the on-site teams. Instead, what we want to do is, uh, or what we, are, not we, want, what we want to do, but what, what we think would be a good approach would be to issue grants. And with grants, I mean not just a few thousand dollars, uh, a few thousand euros, but um, like significant grants, like, like 10K, 20K, depending on, on how well everything worked out. So these are some of, some of the ideas that we have. Nothing is set in stone yet, we need to discuss. Um, so we think that we want to get into contact with local teams. This is basically meant for um, later on in this open space. We, have already, we are already discussing with uh, um, people in, in the Czech Republic, so we're currently looking at Prague as one candidate. The other candidate is Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, we don't have, actually, we don't have a group there yet we can talk to, but we know a couple of people really well, uh, which we can ask and, and which could provide support for us there. But of course, we're gonna um, do the RFP with, with more venues than just these also to, to get a better view of what's available, what we can do. And then we will probably have to decide on the venue, based on the venue quality and the cost that we have, and then talk to the local team to make everything, uh, to, to work out everything, and to make sure that we don't override their local conference and that we don't get in the way because we want to work together with the local team. Uh, because, I mean, the, the whole point of the EPS is to help the community, not to work against it, right? Okay, so I need to speed up a bit. Um, we still have this issue with the domains, uh, with the europython.org domain, but we've not done anything. We have a europython TV uh, domain, which basically goes to the YouTube channel. We use europython IO for systems, europython EU for the website. Uh, we have the uh, Trademark, of course, we tried to, for this conference, to create a new uh, logo. 
the process didn't really work out that well. We tried 99 designs to get a new design. Uh, didn't really help. Uh, then we basically hired the designer from last year again to update the logo, and we came up with uh, this logo, which is inspired by the sea and the the umbrellas that you have here on the on the beach. So it looks nice. Uh, I think everybody likes it, and this worked well. Then for the EPS organization, um, last year, if you remember, we discussed moving the EPS out of Sweden and to some other place where we have more control, especially because we, at that time, we did not have any access to our own bank accounts. But fortunately, Anders Hammers Hammerquist uh, volunteered to help us with this. He works at Open End, um, the organization where uh, we have our or registered address, so that's very helpful. Uh, he can get all the paperwork for us. Uh, he uh, is very well connected locally to accountants and uh, to banks. So what he did is uh, he essentially set up new bank accounts for us at the SEB. So before that, we were at Sweat Bank. We closed that account, or those accounts, we had two. Um, we now have two new accounts for Euros and for SEK at the SEB. Um, and setting this up was very easy because he personally knows people at the SEB branch and so it uh, this really made things a lot easier. He also helped us get the VAT ID. Uh, this was a bit of a mess before because we already had tried to get a VAT ID before and they basically declined us giving one, declined uh, giving us one. Um, and usually if they decline once, it's hard to then actually get one afterwards. But he managed to do that, and so we now have a VAT ID, which makes, the, makes it possible for us to, for example, sponsor, uh, invoice the sponsors directly. And that's what we've also done for EuroPython uh, 2017. So all the sponsor money goes directly to the EPS. So this is... Uh, very good news. So be essentially what we did and at that point was we postponed this moving to a different country. Um, what we still have to figure out is whether we can, by using that VAT ID that we have, whether we can get VAT back from other EU countries. Um, we had an accountant. Uh, she told us that it's not possible to do this because the uh, EPS is a non-profit. Now we have a new accountant, um, and they are more experienced in EU VAT issues, and perhaps we can figure out a way to make that work, because it would enable us to actually then enter contracts with the venues directly, rather than going through the local organization. VAT in general is a huge issue. Uh, it, it looks easy to handle uh, between companies, but because of the EU regulations for conferences, um, the regulation going like this, when you do a conference in a certain location, you have to pay the VAT in, that, in the country of that location. So EPS being in Sweden, in this case, uh, Europython being in Italy, it means that we have to pay taxes in Italy. In order to pay taxes in a country, you have to have a local tax representative for that. So we would have to hire, uh, now we have Python Italia doing this, of course, which makes, a lot, makes things easier. But normally we'd have to then hire a local tax representative doing all the tax reporting and then we'd have to get the taxes back again from, um, uh, from Italy, basically against the, all the expenses that we have and so on. And then because we don't know whether we can get VAT back uh, in Sweden for expenses that we have in other countries, we basically decided to go with a local organization, do everything via that and then um, basically not have this issue. So what we did in order to make that happen is we gave 40k uh, to Python Italia at a 0% loan and basically in order to handle all the initial payments for the contract here. Um, the, all the direct contacts were done by, the, by Python Italia uh, so they basically signed up for the venue and so going forward, unless we get this whole thing with the EU VAT sorted, we have to continue doing this to make things easier. So right now Python Italia is doing the ticketing, doing the um, uh, local sourcing of things that we need. 
and we basically get all the sponsorship money directly into the EPS. And then later on, when we basically then decide on how things should work out, uh, how the budget should be split, the profit, and so on, we have to then do one transfer at the very end between the two organizations to make to even out everything. Okay, so I already talked about this. EPS wants to become something like a, Euro -Python, a European Python Software Foundation, so we want to help the community. Uh, short term, we funded PyCon DE 2016. We funded the Django Girls uh, EuroPython with around 7,000 euros. And we had this uh, ticket discount coupon uh, activity that so we basically we, we send out emails to user groups in Europe to give them uh, easier access to the EuroPython conference. Right, and I'm getting a bit tired. Uh, so now is the time for our for for the treasurer report. Um, yes, uh, current assets in the bank account. Right. Anders sent the um, the details. Miss my mouse. There it is. He sent the details just a few minutes ago. Uh, so let me see whether I can find them. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Okay, so I, ca I can't see what you're seeing, so. Let's just say I showed this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, we, we gave around 40K to Python uh, Italia, so be before we had the, um, the payments from the sponsors coming in, we essentially, uh, well, we didn't have anything much left in the bank accounts, so I think maybe should be something like 10K or so. I don't know whether it shows up here somewhere. Um, That is a good question. I think. It could be an SEK unless it says somewhere. No, it says EU up there. No, that's EU. Oh, that's just where sales are. OK, I'm going um, to report this afterwards when I have actually had a time to look at this. So Anyway, we have enough money. We have at least 40K because we're going to get that back. We're going to uh, get the extra money from, uh, t from 2016 in the next few months, and then uh, we're going to finish the, this conference, probably with a profit as well. It's not clear yet on uh, how big that profit will be. But it's, it's going to be a profit uh, of at least of at least 10K, I think. Probably more like in the area of like 30K. So, a third, yeah, 30K, like what we had in, in the last year. Right, so we, do have, we have two bank accounts, SEK, SEK for, for uh, Swedish Kronos. Uh, we need that account because all the local tax payments go in SEK. Uh, plus, if we want to send money elsewhere, we have to like, for example, USD, uh, we have to use that account. And we have a Euro account for everything else. Then we have PayPal, uh, it's connected to the SEK account, and we have a credit card now. All thanks to Anders. So Anders is watching this on video, so maybe we can give him a big hand for helping us. Okay, now it's time for the auditor report. Auditor this year was Stefan. Stefan, do you have anything to say? Uh, I discussed with Anders and with Mark about the, the, the accounting, and in fact, we have no issues uh, with the, the accounting. Uh, we need 
we wait for some invoice uh, for some Hammonds, but everything is okay for me because I check it the, the incoming uh, incoming invoice and the, the how going uh, for the sponsoring and except that for the the conversion from dollars to euro everything is okay so just that we have to put that in the notes as well so uh. so the next point on the agenda is discharge from liability for the 2016 2017 board so we need to vote now so uh, so do we discharge the board from li liability for last year's work. Um, everybody who is in favor, please raise your hand. I think the board should abstain, right? So, abstain? <laughs> abstain? No, yeah, abstain? No, <laughs> just to check, so everybody, everybody. 16. Yeah, yeah, so 16 in favor? Zero abstains, zero yes. No. Huh? It's not you know, really. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Oh, fifteen. Sixteen. And margin, yes. Yeah, yeah, sixteen. Yeah. We sixteen. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, then we have uh, candidates for the board twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen. <clears throat> As you can see, a couple of board members did not run again for board. A couple of, uh, well, from the existing board. Uh, so we have uh, Christian, we have Daria, we have a uh, new candidate, it's Jill. Jill, maybe you can ta say a few things about yourself. Please welcome Jill. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jill, and I like Python, and I like helping out here. Yeah, that's really it. <laughs> so you've probably seen Jill run around the conference venue all the time. <laughs> He's chair of the support uh, work group, so he has a lot to do there. Um, then we have Anders. Anders is not here, unfortunately. Uh, Anders uh, would like to run for board as well, and he manages basically the, uh, the uh, financial side of things, and he would then if he is elected for board, he would then become the treasurer of the uh, EPS. Uh, Alexander, you know myself and Alex Savio, he cannot be here, um, but he would still wants to help on the, on the board and he has lots of in institutional knowledge and, and contacts. And so um, the existing board thinks that this new board is actually a very good board, so. <laughs> So um, now let's let's vote for the for the individual members. So we're going to do individual votes. Um, what uh, we are going to do is we're going to vote for each uh, one uh, the positive votes, abstains, and and, and the no votes. And then someone gets on the board if they have more yes votes than no votes. That's how it works. So, <clears throat> so uh, now we first vote for. Christian, Christian Barra. So, who's in favor for Christian Barra being bored? Um, yes. yes, you're yes. Christian, you're undecided yet? Yes. You're yes as well. So, uh, let's say 16 in favor, just double checking. Any abstain? Non favor? Okay, 16 votes for Christian. Every, no, yeah, no zero. No. Of course, you can work for yourself. No. Everybody can work for himself, right? Yeah, sure, you can work yeah, for himself. Yeah, you can yes. wish not to work for him. That's okay. Okay. So the next uh, is, uh, is uh, Daria. Um, so who's in favor for Daria staying and or being a board member for this year? Abstain? No, no, sorry. Abstain? Who's no, who says no? So basically, yeah, it's also like, you, you also voting for yourself? Okay, then we have 16, yes. Let's just like keep it simple. Yeah, 16. Yeah, 16. All right, as uh, next for uh, Jill, Jill Berto, Gon, Gon, Gon Kaufs. 
So who's in favor of full? Jill? And I said, 16. Stefan, you're also in favor? Yeah. So 16, yes. Just like for the record, abstain? No? Okay. 16 in favor. And then for Anders Hammer, Hammer Quist in favor? Yeah? So it's 16 in favor. Abstain? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Zero? No. Uh, then I would like to uh, ask Daria to do the next board candidate because I cannot be leading the session and more like chairing. Who is your favor? Of, of, uh, <laughs> to voting for B. Alexander Hendorf in the board this next this and next year. Plus one, we have 17 members. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto. Abstain. No. Okay, let's uh, continue with uh, Mark Andre Lemberg, our chair, who's in favor. So that's 17. Yes. Uh, abstain. No. Zero. Okay. And then. Uh, uh, um, uh, Alexandra Savio, who is in favor? Like 17 in favor. Abstain? No? Yeah, zero, zero. Six, six, 17 in favor. Okay, then we need uh, to elect a, elect a chair of the board. Um, I basically nominated, my, nominated myself again. Um, I, <laughs> which, I mean, no one wants to do this, so. <laughs> so who is in favor? So uh, Mark Andre stays our well beloved chair. So I see 16, uh, 17 in favor, just like abstain, no, so 17 in favor, zero, zero. Um, then we have something new this year. Um, this is kind of like a bit of a last minute thing. Uh, we want to add a new position to the EPS, uh, vice chair position, because the bylaws currently only have a chair position. And because the chair is rather important for the EPS, because the chair has to essentially sign the contracts, uh, if the chair breaks away, then basically the EPS becomes, uh, well, dysfunctional, so it cannot operate anymore. And uh, what we think is it would be a good idea to have a vice chair position so that the vice chair can then basically um, fulfill the chair positions in case the chair has to step down or uh, just uh, is not available anymore. So it says please vote here. You haven't seen the changes. These are the changes. So you can just, I can just read them. So uh, one change is that we have uh, on the agenda for the, for the General Assembly, we're gonna add election of the vice chair person of the board. And then uh, position uh, 13, it now says the board consists of a chairperson, a vice chairperson, and two to seven board members. Previously, we had just a chairperson and two to eight board members, the chair not being counted in this case as board member. Um, and in this case, in, in case the chairperson steps down the, during the election term, the vice chairperson shall replace the chairperson for the remainder of the term. In case the vice chairperson steps down as well, the board may elect an intermediate chair for the remaining of, of the term or call in a general assembly to vote in a new board. So this is what we'd, the old uh, board would like to suggest as change. Uh, we need to vote on this. Does anyone have any issues with this? I mean, just uh, maybe all questions before we vote. No? Okay, then let's vote. Who's in favor for these bylaws change? Yeah, 17 in favor. Abstain? No's. Okay. So this being favor. effective now, we need to vote on a vice chair. And Alexander nominated. Uh, yeah, so 
himself, or I pushed him to. So. <laughs> Is in favor of uh, Alexander Hendorf as the co-chair? <coughs> Seventeen. Who is abstain? Knows? Seventeen zero zero. Okay, next thing. So we need again an auditor for the bank accounts and we need one replacement in case the auditor becomes unavailable to do the actual auditing. Any volunteers for this? Okay, so who's in favor that Stefan, or should we nominate the, yeah, who's in favor who's, that Stefan uh, is the auditor for the European Society? It's just for one year, so uh, it's, I mean, not. So 17, yes, abstain, nobody against, also nobody. And we need a, a replacement or basically a backup. Yes, and I think, the, um, yeah, we need somebody to. Uh, yeah, we need one more, um, like a replacement auditor. Some, we need a volunteer because Raul, who was doing it before, is, is not here, unfortunately. So, and actually, it's an easy job. I, actually, I started as an audio, auditor. I mean, like <laughs> at, in, in Berlin. So, yeah, it's 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 a yeah. So it's an easy thing. So, I, it's the, the auditor. We need to speed up a bit. Yeah, is the auditor must the auditor be a member? No. No? Okay, then. Uh, Mario volunteered to be auditor. So, who's in favor of, for Mario Thiel to become the placement auditor or like backup auditor? Okay, I see 17 in favor. Abstain. Um, no. Okay, just, just to double check because you raised your hand to enter, like, you, are you EPS members? Are you? Already APS members. I, I see could could I just ask what's what's the next session after this one? Yeah, just like check. Okay, so seventeen yes and zero abstains and zero no's. Coffee break. Okay. So can we can we uh, over? Can we overrun a bit, or is it? Yeah, it's a 3.45. Okay, so let's just speed up a bit, and then, so that we still manage this. So the next thing is uh, optional election of a nomination committee. The idea being that we have a, a committee that basically then um, checks all the nominations and, um, and proposes them to for the next election. We've so far never needed this. We don't think we're going to. We're going to so. Uh, the board thinks that this is not needed, but it's really up to you. I mean, if you think this is needed, then please speak up. Otherwise, we can vote on not having it. So, who's? Yeah, who, who's in favor that we set? Uh, oh no, let's say who's who's okay that there's no uh, um, um, election committee? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, um, nomination committee. For, uh, for, as proposed by the board. Okay, um, that's 17, yes. Uh, abstain, no, thank you. Okay, we're almost done. So, um, budget presentation. So, basically, this is what we, what we did with the money that we had. Uh, like I said, we, we funded a few smaller events. Um, we also started buying for this for this conference. We started buying goods that we uh, want to keep as EPS. Those are will be or will be EPS owned. Um, so we bought power strips quite a lot, 150, uh, 140 of those. Uh, we bought the roll-up displays that you see around here, the schedule banner, the large one outside. Those were all bought in a way that you can reuse them in, in future years. So we're going to put everything into a storage box here in Rimini, and then when we have the location for the next conference. Uh, we're just going to ship everything over there. We bought the TVs, we bought routers, uh, we bought um, APs for the wireless, backup APs using mobile uh, SIM cards. Uh, we rented the storage box for everything. 
uh, and we have regular expense, which is it's the only regular expense that we have. It's the web servers, about 100 euros per month. And uh, everything else that we did was basically uh, handled by Matteo from Python Italia with the help of Christian. Uh, Christian lended his credit card because Python Italia doesn't have one and for buying on Amazon you need one. So he helped a lot there. So this is the, um, basically the budget presentation that we have. I could also show you the budget, but we don't have time for that now, unfortunately. I can show you later on if you want to, or you can just uh, come to me. So um, we need to vote on accepting the budget, and we need to vote on the decision on the membership fees. So far, the membership fees have always been, no, not always, actually. They were one euro at, uh, in the early days, and, um, but no one actually collected the euro. Um, and then at some point, we set it to zero, which is more realistic. Right. It's like two votes now? Yeah, it's two votes, okay. yes. So who's in favor of that we accept the budget as proposed? Can you see? Abstain? Okay, that's one abstain. Who's against the budget? Who does says no? Well, I think that we would even consider any uh, five euros. In the oh, no, no, we're on the budget. We're on the slide before. We're on the budget vote. Ah, okay. So, okay, then. Again, who is in favor that this budget is fine for our financial plan? It's just a planning thing, actually. So, 16, abstain. One, abstain. And against, no's, zero no's. Okay, and now we move to uh, uh, the uh, membership fees. Uh, the, um, uh, do you, do you, there's something you want to say or like discuss it? Maybe. Yeah, I, 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 mm -hmm. and as it seems that uh, joining the conference is not necessarily a way to finance the, no, I think. the, the mm -hmm. European society, having, for example, a five euros fee for one thousand people, it could give the society, I don't know, it no, could like extra amount of mm -hmm. the budget. No, the thing is, uh, I mean, we only have like 180 members, or do you know? 182. Yeah, so, and basically yeah. collecting the money, five euros, which I think would be a fair amount, but we also have, would have like a lot of administration stuff, and we would carry. So basically, I think, basically, um, I, I, I think we should rather stick with zero, because we have administration overhead then, and uh, we need a volunteer to do that, and, you know, like getting people's bank accounts and stuff, so I don't think... I th I don't think we really make any money from it worth the effort. That's why. Oh. Okay, any more comments, ideas? Raise it to 1,000 euros now. <laughs> <laughs> because then the administration is well worth it. So, that okay, would be a realistic um, amount, too. Uh, <laughs> who's in favor that we, uh, the membership fee stays at zero euros for the next year? Okay. Um, I think that's Stefan, like 17. Um, abstains? No, like 17 in favor, no abstains. No okay. Knows. Forget the please vote here because we have not received any motions from the members, so we can skip this. And we're done. So if you have any questions, um, please ask now. Or if it's something specific to 2018, then would you please come to the open space session. Otherwise, I'd say thank you.